Building an empire, dominating high school strength and conditioning. Coaches must educate themselves. Performance versus aesthetics, strength training via compound barbell lifts, form over ego, competitive and encouraging atmosphere, consistency. The problem. In general, people are illogical morons. They frequently make decisions not based on logic or reason, but rather because of an underlying emotion, ignorance, or tradition. It's always been done this way. Unfortunately, this stupidity spans all walks of life, including high school coaching, where a lack of logic is too often pervasive, especially in the gym. Sports coaches, who are typically excellent people and are vastly undereducated in strength and conditioning. They print out poorly designed cookie cutter programs and expect enormous results. Or worse, kids are left to do whatever they want in the weight room. Full of enthusiasm, they still ultimately choose a hodgepodge program made of a mix of the latest fitness trends and weight training fallacies and end up spinning their wheels and never making progress. The athletes are left pathetically weak and underweight and the only thing that grows are their egos from 6 inch high squats and their biceps from training them 3 days per week. Our system is broken. If a change is ever to occur, it must start with the coach. Typically, you'll see kids running through one of two types of programs in high schools. The first type are cookie cutter programs that are printed out and handed to the kids, and they are told to follow it with little or no attention paid to properly teaching the lifts. The sports coach can direct the strength program from the comfort of his office, and he believes his kids are getting the best because they are following the program put together by professionals such as Bigger, Faster, Stronger, the Oklahoma program, or the Nebraska program. They never consider that in their high school weight room are prepubescent, pubescent, and post-pubescent athletes spread across a vast range of athletic abilities. They believe that what works at Oklahoma or Nebraska with amazing athletes will clearly work for the weak, unathletic 14-year-old kid who can't walk and chew gum at the same time. The second type of program, perhaps, is even more worthless, is one where the coach thinks he knows how to plan strength training for high school athletes, so he writes a program that is nothing more than picking and choosing bits and pieces of his favorite programs and exercises until the kids are left with a useless bastardization of several programs, comprised of 8 to 10 insignificant exercises per day. Lies my coaches told me. Unfortunately, it is also the high school weight room where fitness fallacies run rampant. It is in this atmosphere where our young athletes learn such myths as squats are bad for the knees, heavy lifting will make you slow and inflexible, weight training for prepubescent kids will stunt their growth, and lifting for female athletes will make them bulky. Skinny kids want to look like a Hollister model and don't want to get too big because one day all that muscle will turn to fat. And the fat kids are trying to turn their fat into muscle. And no explode and methyl draw will make them all look like Ronnie Coleman. But creatine and whey protein are bad for the kidneys, right? And the way to condition our athletes from cornerbacks to offensive linemen is to run the mile. It is unfortunate that our kids are so often put at a disadvantage by their coaches, all because of ignorance and lack of logic and reason. The solution, how to build the empire. Coaches must educate themselves. The first step in fixing the broken system is for the sport coach to educate himself about strength and conditioning, specifically with young athletes. Each school system spends tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars per year on football. Football equipment, coaches' salaries, high-tech video equipment, and gladly sends the coaches to various clinics and seminars on the latest football strategy. These same schools often have $200,000 $200,000 to $300,000 worth of equipment in a state-of-the-art weight room, but not one cent has ever been spent to educate the coaches on how to properly, properly use this equipment. 75% of it is worthless anyways. How to teach the lifts or to program appropriately for younger athletes. Which will make the bigger impact for your team? The expensive clinic on running the newest offensive scheme or the starting strength seminar that will teach you how to build men from little boys in the shortest amount of time possible. You could put in a new scheme this year with the same kids you have now, 
Or you can run the same scheme, but with kids who have put on 30 pounds of muscle, increase their squats by 100 pounds, and decrease their 40 times by half a second. Make the logical choice. At the very least, every high school strength coach in America should read starting strength and attend a training camp. The information you learn is invaluable, and after finishing the book, you'll know more than 99% of sports coaches in the country about strength and conditioning, which means that you'll know more than probably every coach in your conference. Coaches who run successful strength programs in their high school almost always have two other characteristics in common. One, their kids like them. And two, they practice what they preach and strength train themselves. A successful program requires hard work and in order to get that from the kids, they need to like you, respect you, and know that you train in much the same way because it's how to get the most out of your training. Once the coach has thoroughly and properly educated and immersed himself in the strength and conditioning world, which is an ongoing process, building the complete high school strength and conditioning program becomes not just about the exercise, sets, and reps, but about selling that program to the kids, staff, and parents, running it efficiently, and building the perfect atmosphere. Here's what we've tried to do in the high school where I've coached for six years. Performance versus aesthetics. Teach kids to train for performance and not aesthetics. Training for performance is vastly superior to training for aesthetics for everyone, but it should be obvious for the high school athlete. Training for performance makes you a man. Training for aesthetics makes you gay. We educate our kids that becoming a badass means having a huge squat, deadlift, big ass and hamstrings and thicker rectors. Aesthetic improvement is a byproduct of training for performance, but training specifically for aesthetics will not lead to a performance improvement on the field. Being brutally strong and athletic and looking that way is great. Training to look like the situation is not. Strength training via compound barbell lifts. I believe strength training using the basic compound barbell lifts is the single most important aspect of our training. We all squat, bench press, overhead press, and deadlift. These lifts are the foundation of our training, and while we do variations, we still stick to the basics. Add cleans, heavy rows, pull-ups, dips, barbell curls, push-ups, and posterior chain work, and those exercises should make up about 95% of what you do. <clears throat> no lift has a greater impact on our program than the full squat. The reality is that full squats are just plain harder to do than anything else and therefore build more strength and muscle than any other lift by loading the entire body better than any other lift and by creating a greater hormonal response than any other lift. If you don't squat, you aren't an athlete. The other compound lifts are incredibly important as well and we strive to constantly drive up our strength on these lifts. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of our energy is spent doing the basic compound barbell lifts. A downfall of many coaches' programs is that they believe that specialty exercises like core work, the jammer, the speed ladder, and balance training give their programs a substance. In reality, those specialty exercises are worthless when compared to squats, deadlifts, bench press, cleans, and presses. The most effective training is simple and hard. Form over ego. At no point can an athlete or coach's ego compromise form in the weight room. At all times, perfect form and full range of motion must be stressed, from warm-ups to max effort lifts. Correct form is crucial to staying healthy. An athlete who allows ego to, com to compromise form will eventually injure himself. However, if correct form is utilized, it's very hard to get injured. Furthermore, when an entire program stresses form, it lends credibility to the program as a whole. You may see other schools brag about a 500 squat that you know was a foot above parallel. You have the satisfaction to know that you can bury 405 for 5 and that you'll be stronger and better prepared on the field as well. Competitive and encouraging atmosphere. I believe that athletes must have goals to help them gauge success in the gym and to access and to assess the quality of their progress. The simplest and most gratifying assessment tool of these goals is the personal record, the PR. We believe so much in its power 
that we focus a vast majority of our work around the PR and celebrate it no matter how big or how small. From Strong Jim's Philosophy of Training. Record boards, pound clubs, t-shirts, prizes, etc. are all good ideas to help facilitate the competitive atmosphere in the weight room. At the end of each session, celebrate every PR. Post the athletes' numbers around the weight room so it's visible to the rest of the school. Understand that helping each other is the key to your success. Everyone should be coaching, spotting, offering advice, and listening to one another. Play loud heavy metal music. Provide chalk for your kids. Learn how to coach using positive cues. Soon, the athletes will take ownership in the program and will feel they are part of an exclusive club. I believe that competition with others, as well as oneself, is foundational to help an individual reach their goals. A competitive but supportive atmosphere in the weight room must be completely deliberate. A self-confident, mentally tough athlete is not the norm, but rather the exception in America. My goal is to produce the exception. I believe training in a competitive environment is one step towards that goal. From Strong Jim's Philosophy of Training. Consistency. Consistency is absolutely foundational for success. Results don't come overnight. They come after weeks and months and years and decades of dedication in the trenches of the gym. Consistency yields results, especially when you come to train on those days when the last thing you want to do is be in the gym. Consistency is also a direct byproduct of atmosphere. When athletes train in a competitive but encouraging environment and have ownership in the program, the vast majority will become addicted to the progress and will be there every single day. Program appropriately. We focus our programming around concurrent methodology, commonly referred to as the conjugate system. That is to say that we work to reach multiple training goals at the same time, getting bigger, stronger, faster, and more explosive, and bringing up weak points. We believe it's important to train multiple motor abilities at once so the individual gets the most optimal training response. It is important to note, however, that the vast majority of your athletes, especially in the beginning, will be rank novices. When an athlete is still a novice, all facets of training are improved by simply getting stronger via the starting strength program. Improving speed, vertical jump, and agility will all be accomplished as the novice gets stronger at the barbell lifts. However, as an athlete progresses through his high school career, his training age, and whether he is off-season, pre-season, or mid-season will begin to determine how to appropriately program for optimum results. Beginners and Novices We believe in basic sub-maximal linear progression for beginners. In its simplest terms, that means that we believe beginners need to lift in the 4-7 to seven rep range using 80-90% to 90 of one rep max and add weight to each progressive training session, linear progression, we have used the starting strength program with tremendous results with our novice lifters. We believe the simple yet effective type of training is the most optimal for beginners and will allow the greatest combination of neural efficiency, learning the movements, hypertrophy, muscle growth, and strength increase. If a beginner eats enough food and utilizes proper restoration techniques, it is possible to gain large amounts of muscle up to even 30 to 40 pounds in a three to four month period and dramatically increased strength. Squat and deadlift increases of up to 100 to 150 pounds before stagnation occurs. Intermediates. Simple linear progression cannot last forever. However, and thus, when an individual reaches a certain strength level, progress cannot continue to be made linearly. At this point, the trainee is usually placed on a peaking program and the barbell lifts are brought down to the 1-5 to five rep range. Additionally, periodization containing planned periods of loading, 1-3 to three weeks of really hard work where the central nervous system is highly stressed, and planned periods of deloading, 1-2 to two weeks of restoration and lighter training where the central nervous system is allowed to recover, <coughs> must come into practice. A loading-deloading scheme allows an individual to take his body up to a breaking point called overreaching and then deload or back off. This type of planning allows the body to make gains greater than if loading and deloading were not used. 
We have used several different programs over the years for intermediates, but we really like Jim Wendler's 531, with just a few minor modifications, not bastardizations, for our intermediates. We usually run them through the program four times before moving on to a more advanced concurrent conjugate program. Advanced Athletes When our athletes advance to this stage, we begin a multifaceted approach to systematically and concurrently improving or maintain all areas of training. Our program at this level is heavily influenced by Louis Simmons and Westside Barbell, but we tailor the specifics towards the needs of our athlete. Our kids will do frequent max effort work in the core lifts or variations of those lifts. Dynamic training for the core lifts, along with snatch and cleans, along with repetition work with mu supplemental and accessory exercises to build hypertrophy, things like front squats, good mornings, glued ham raises, board presses, etc. The athletes also work on bringing up individual weaknesses injury rehab and prevention, programmed plyometric upper and lower body work, and the addition of accommodating resistance, bands and chains. It sounds complicated. It isn't. 90% of the work the athletes do are still the heavy compound lifts or close variations of that lift. We just let them work up to one rep maxes frequently, and it allows them to compete more often in variations of the lifts. Moving from novice to intermediate to advanced. When a lifter advances from one program to the next, we make a really big deal about it. We name our programs according to school colors, white, silver, and black. All novices start on the white program, starting strength. The goal on this program is to keep making progress for as long as possible. Making progress for six weeks and installing means you did it wrong or didn't do what you were supposed to do to succeed. When we have athletes make progress for four to five months, we celebrate it. But by that point, the kids all know who did the program correctly because they'll be 40 pounds heavier and all their lifts will have doubled. We set minimum requirements to move to the intermediate program, including attendance. And when the athlete meets those and has stopped making progress, we move them up. The silver program is our 531 program and we have requirements there as well before they can move on to the black program. By the time our kids are on the black program, maxing out on various lifts, kicking ass, and taking names, they are literally different kids than the ones who started with us. They are confident on and off the field. They absolutely love training. They can help coach the younger kids any way they can, and they look like they've been cut out of stone. Give your kids attainable but difficult goals. When they meet them, celebrate and reward them. Everything else. Warm up appropriately. We believe that you must include in your training a proper warm up, as well as a restoration technique to help keep the body healthy. We love foam rollers. Actually, we make cheap ones by purchasing six inch PVC pipe and wrapping a cut yoga mat around it. You can make four PVC rollers for about $10 this way. The PVC roller do an amazing job of breaking up scar tissue, adhesions and tightness in the soft tissue and preparing the body for training. We've had athletes who complained of a lower body injury for several weeks and after 10 minutes on a PVC roller they were training again with no pain. Every athlete can come in the weight room before their training session and start PVC rolling. We have our athletes concentrate on the erectors, hip flexors, extensors, abductors, adductors and IT band for lower body. For upper body, they focus on lats and traps and then grab a lacrosse ball and roll their anterior and posterior delts, triceps, and chest. The entire process shouldn't take longer than five minutes. After foam PVC rolling the athletes, do a few static and dynamic hip and shoulder base mobility movements. After foam PVC rolling, the athletes do a few static and dynamic hip and shoulder base mobility movements. We like static stretching, especially for our bigger athletes, for the simple reason that most bigger guys are inflexible and we've seen it work for years now. Just like the PVC rolling, the static and dynamic stretching is very short, usually only an additional five minutes. Condition appropriately. It takes a lifetime to build world-class strength. It takes about a month 
to be conditioned and ready for football or basketball or volleyball, the army, etc. Because of the body's amazing means to adapt quickly to appropriate conditioning work, then there is no need to truly condition our athletes for their sport until they are in the near preseason. However, energy systems training is still fundamental to an athlete's program. There are two types of energy systems. One, the aerobic energy system, in which energy ATP becomes available through the utilization of oxygen. And two, the anaerobic system, where energy is generated from non-oxygen sources, primarily stored ATP for very short bursts of energy, less than 10 seconds, and glycogen for longer bursts of high-intensity exercise, less than one minute, is known as the anaerobic glycolytic pathway. The majority of sports, including football, utilize this anaerobic glycolytic pathway. Therefore, appropriate conditioning for a sport will utilize the same energy system of that sport and will often attempt to mimic the rest-to-work ratio of the sport. If you consider the rest-to-work ratio in football, players go as hard as they can during a play, approximately 5 to 7 seconds, then rest for 30 to 45 seconds after each play, before the next play is started again. Very simply then, to appropriately condition the body's energy systems for football, you would train very intensely for 5 to 7 seconds, think prowler sprint, sled sprint, hill sprint, tire flips, and then rest for 30 to 45 seconds before completing another 5 to 7 second set. There is never any reason for a football player or other athlete involved in an anaerobic glycolytic sport to run the mile for time. The abuse it causes the organism coupled with the fact that it trains a different energy system than the one used in the sport makes it useless, if not completely detrimental to the program. The amazing thing about training in the anaerobic glycolytic pathway is that your body will burn an enormous amount of calories both during and after the exercise while your metabolism remains elevated for up to 24 hours after the training. There will be an increased shift by your muscle fibers to fast switch dominance. Additionally, there will be an upregulation of aerobic, anaerobic, and ATP enzyme activity, meaning that all energy systems will become more efficient at generating energy and burning calories. Additionally, it is very easy to train in this energy system using concentric-only exercise, which makes recovering from the conditioning much easier than traditional long-distance running. Note. Because of the amount of calories burned from this form of exercise, it is important that underweight athletes use it only during preseason to specifically condition for their sport. However, fatter athletes will find it as an excellent tool to help shed excess body fat. We usually add concentric only sessions immediately after training and with our bigger athletes who are doing it for health reasons, we almost always make it a finishing competitive exercise at the end of their training. For example, At the end of their training session, we might go out to the parking lot and each guy will flip a 500 pound tire for three sets of six flips and will time each set and try to beat everyone else. The kids love it and it helps them lose body fat, produces mental toughness and prepares them to be athletes. Jimmy's and Joe's. Building a successful strength and conditioning program at a high school level doesn't have to be an enigma and is not as complicated as others would make it out to be. All it takes is coaching, all it takes is coaches who care enough about their kids to educate themselves on how to train them simply and effectively by teaching them how to properly perform and program the basic lifts. If you want to make a huge impact on your sport and the lives of your kids, you coach, then give them the gift of strength. The old saying in football is that winning football isn't X's and O's, it's Jimmy's and Joe's. Regardless of the sport, the scheme, the strategy, the discipline, or the organization, it's hard work, it's hard to win with weak, underweight, slow, non-athletic kids. Do something that will change your Jimmy's and your Joe's, and you'll give your kids the best chance to win both on and off the field.